good uh, afternoon. Uh, winter in Jerusalem, winter in Israel, uh, and also winter uh, in other parts of uh, Europe and Asia, in the north part of uh, in the northern northern hemisphere. And uh, we are again in a meeting of Ma'avarim, and today um, on the edge, on the interview, how to prepare oneself. And it all started with Carlos, Carlos who is uh, a PhD postdoc of mine, who was invited to interview for, for a fellowship, and we thought how to prepare. And then I met, the day after I met uh, Joel, and we, we had a chat and coffee together, and Joel said, uh, yes, I can do that, as usually. And Joel is doing this uh, kind of uh, Mavarim uh, uh, presentation on, on, on professional skills for the third of first time now. So thank you very much, uh, Joel. I will just say that Joel is one of the senior social scientists uh, now operating in, in the world. He's also a emeritus professor at the Ibu University. He moved to Israel and is um, visiting, uh, visiting the Ibu University and the emeritus of Washington University. So thank you very much, uh, Joel, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, David, and thank you for inviting me to this and good to see you all on this uh, wintry day. And I um, hope I get to meet all of you in person sometime and we don't have to do this on Zoom. So um, there are many different kinds of interviews for academic jobs, non-academic jobs, postdocs, live interviews, Zoom interviews. They all have different special qualities to them that you're going to have to consider. But there are elements that uh, they have in common, which I'm trying to, trying to uh, talk about today. So this lecture is gonna be a little generic. It might not fit the exact kind of interview you're going for, but, and it's going to mostly um, focus on interviewing for academic jobs. Um, also to some degree postdocs uh, those will be in the foreground, but if you have questions about other kinds of interviews, feel free to ask them. So I'm going to divide my remarks into three sections. First of all is the um, pre-interview preparation, which is very important. The second part will be the, the actual interview, what you do on an interview, how to behave. And the third shorter part is on the post-interview. What do you do afterwards? So let's start with the pre-interview. So my first three words for you are prepare, prepare, prepare. The more preparation, the better. Usually the interview process starts with a phone call or sometimes an email telling you that you are have been selected for an interview, the first thing you want to do is to express how happy you are to receive the, inter the invitation to the interview. It's part of enthusiasm for, for the job or the postdoc that you're applying for. And I'm gonna come back to that question of enthusiasm because it is very important. Um, so you should uh, get a, as much information as you can during that initial contact and follow it up with an email saying, again, how delighted you are and ask if there's any information that you should know beforehand, especially when you'll be meeting with um, people or will be on Zoom. What, what do you need to know uh, before? And ask them as well, what you can send them that they may not have already asked for. Um, that could be a chapter of yours, a syllabus, a published article, something that is going to um, show who you are. If you know the organization that's interviewing you, if you know the names of some people there who have interests similar to yours, ask if you can meet those people. Aside from the group Zoom that you may have to do, 
um, you want, might have individual Zooms with people who have similar interests, ask if it's okay. Some people will say, no, we don't want to do that. Others would like to do that. Um, it's, uh, if, it, if it's live, you're going to have multiple meetings um, the day of the interview. So make sure that you ask to see the people who you think might be valuable for you. People with whom your work intersects or is complementary to, um, who would be interested in the kinds of things that you do. If it's an academic job and it's a live interview, ask if you can meet with some of the students, uh, graduate students uh, or um, undergraduates as well. Graduate students are preferable. Um, one question here, should you accept um, the interview invitation if you most likely would not take the job? Okay, you're getting, sometimes you get an interview and you say, Ugh, it's not really the job I want, it's not the place I want, it's a job in, uh, you know, Mongolia, I don't want to go to Mongolia. Um, should you accept the interview invitation anyway? And I have what I call the 5% rule. And that rule is, if there's a 5% chance that you might take that job, accept the invitation. If there's a 0% chance, don't take it. It wastes the time of the people, the uh, resources and energy of the people uh, inviting you. If there's a 5% chance, you're at least open to hearing something that might convince you. And in that case, you express, still express a lot of enthusiasm. This is very interesting. Yes, I'm interested. Go, take the, take the, um, take the invitation. Research, you have to do research before the interview. And you're going to research, first of all, the organization itself, whether it's a departmental, uh, a department in a university, the entire university, a company, the grant giving institution, no matter what you're interviewing for, how are they organized? Is there an underlying orientation? What do they want in this job? Read the job, inter the job description very, very carefully. Go to their website, do a general Google search for any articles on the company or the department or the people in the department. Um, if it's an academic job, make sure you get a hold of the curriculum. See what courses are taught. See what courses are not taught, which you might be able to fill gaps for. It's very, very important to look over the curriculum. If it's a company, look at what products they're selling, what, what, find out any public financial information on them that you can. So you're looking for three things as you do your research. Number one, how would you work with the structure that they have, okay? How would you be complementary to what they're already doing? How would you fit well? They want people who are going to slide into jobs without disrupting the existing structure terribly. But conversely, the, the other thing you're going to look for is what they lack, what they're missing that you could provide, what kinds of courses, what kinds of uh, skills, mentoring, whatever it is, does seem to be absent that you could fill for that organization or that department. And finally, are there red flags um, that would make you not want to take the job? Look carefully um, at what some of the negatives might be that would make you very hesitant to take that job. Know those things in advance. You're gonna to wanna to ask about them and find out as much as you can about them. Besides researching the organization, you also want to research the people um, individually. Find out as much as you can about the chair of the department, if it's a department, about the head of the search committee, if it's an academic job, about the dean, the CEO, the president of the granting organization, if it's a grant, a postdoc. 
find out if you can, and this is very important, the people who will interview you, the names of the people who are on the search committee and who you will be meeting in the course of the interview. It's perfectly okay to ask that um, when you're invited or subsequently, and even ask for a list of the people. Um, they may not want to tell you, that's fine too, but most places would be happy to tell you whom you're going to meet with. And um, both the people who will formally interview you, that's often the search committee, and the people who are not formally interviewing you. That is people whom you're just going to meet at dinner or at a lunch or in their office for a little while. And what you wanna research with all these people is first get their bios, get their CVs. As, uh, most of them are online and it shouldn't be too hard to do. Get a hold of anything they have published and read that material. What you're looking for are things in their research or their background that intersect with your own interests, okay? You, you don't have to have the people doing exactly what you're doing, but if somehow there's some connection to what you're doing, to what they're doing, you're going to be more valuable to them um, if they feel there's something that you are going to give them, provide for them. Look for things in their research, their background, anything that intersects with yours. Um, I, I just got a personal note. We had someone interviewing at the University of Washington a few years ago. He's now a really famous academic, but he was just getting out of graduate school at the time. And he came in, he came into my office and we talked and he said, oh, I see you were born in Roosevelt, New Jersey, that I was born in Roosevelt, New Jersey. And I said, yeah. He said, I wasn't born far from there either. And we talked, talked a bit about that. That kind of thing really helps. It really sort of makes you more than just one of the interviewees, but someone who's real, a person around it, has uh, intersecting interests with the other person. The other uh, element of research I wanna mention is talk to anybody you can outside the organization you're interviewing for who can help you learn more about the organization, your own mentors, your, um, uh, your dissertation committee, find out, they know, they know people in these places. They know if there are internal divisions, they may know more what the department is looking for than is stated in the job description. So use as many outside resources and connections as you can to ask about the place where you're interviewing. Next in your preparation is you want to prepare questions, written questions. And these questions are different for different people. You wanna talk to the chair, um, if you're going to meet him or her, to the members of the search committee and any others you meet. I think don't ask about salary that comes later, but do ask about teaching. Do people teach, take teaching seriously? How, how do people cooperate on teaching? What kinds of courses are they thinking about in the job that they're um, uh, advertising? Um, ask about research in the department or the company. Ask about the curriculum. You've gotten some, you've, you have some knowledge. So you're, when you ask, you're going to do, be able to do a back and forth with them since you already have a basis. Ask about whether people collaborate in the department on research um, and who, who might, uh, how that collaboration goes, whether it's formal, informal, how, how is it done? And have individual questions for faculty members, okay? If it's an in-person interview or you're going to do individual Zooms with some of the members of the department, which I really recommend strongly, you wanna have questions for them. I see you've written an article on such and such. Are you still working on that article? What kinds of research are you doing? Have questions for them 
What kinds of teaching do you do? How are the students in the department? What's the quality of the graduate students? And so on and so forth. Prepare these questions, have them ready. It's very important to do that. And finally, prepare and prepare and prepare your formal job talk if there is one. In most cases for academic jobs, there are job talks. And um, I didn't know, David, whether you wanted me to talk about the job talk too much. Uh, maybe I can leave it for the end a little bit. It's, a, it's the subject of, a, of another whole lecture I could give. <laughs> that we that we have already on the on the yeah. on 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 Marvarim, so yeah so I think you can get the recording on that um, but I'll talk a little bit about it later and if you want to ask some questions about it you can um, uh, you want to think about how to organize your talk how to present your PowerPoint um, many different aspects which we can get to one thing I will say about the job talk is remember. This is an oral presentation. And you must remember that an oral presentation is very different from a written presentation because people absorb differently. When they read, they can, if their mind wanders, they can go back over the last sentence. If their mind wanders, which it does during a job talk, then you say some point and they start thinking about it and they miss the next two minutes of what you say. There's no going back for them. So it's very, very important for you to make your points clearly and actually repeatedly because people will miss them the first time or the second time. And, it's, uh, and you don't want to get too complicated in oral presentations. I'll come back to that if we can talk about that a little bit. Um, it's very important in your preparation to do mock interviews. This can be with your spouse, your parents, your children, your friends, your colleagues, your professors, if they're willing to do it. You want to do two kinds of mock interviews. One is the, in, a mock interview means a practice interview. You want to do um, a practice on the common kinds of questions that they'll ask you. It's very, very important to go over that. You know, the key is you don't want to speak too long, or but you don't want to be too short. You want to get people who will tell you going on too long and it's boring, or you didn't tell us enough, it's too short. So you really got to get that happy medium. So the first is to answer the kinds of questions they ask you in the interview uh, about yourself, usually about your research, about your goals, what your next research project is. There are very standard questions. And the second thing, if you have a job talk, if you have a presentation, then you have to practice that presentation, particularly in front of people who will be able to give you positive feedback. Sometimes the feedback gets overwhelming, but um, try and pick good people for that. Um, Okay, so that's the first part. This is the preparation you're going to do before the interview, and it's, um, it's very, very important, as I said. Now to the second part, the interview itself. Okay, some small things and then some more uh, central things. First, how do you dress? Um, you want to find out the norms of the organization itself. How do people dr dress in this company or in this um, uh, grant giving institution that you're applying for a postdoc for or in the department you, you are? And whatever that norm is, you dress up a bit from that. You don't have to dress up a lot from that, but you have to be on one higher level, right? You want to be dressed so that it is not the main focus of what you're doing, that you're too informal or you're too formal. Um, you don't want people to be distracted by what you're wearing. Okay, that's... Let me come back now to the positivity and enthusiasm. Um, don't express 
any doubts in the course of the interview. If they say to you, look, we have, uh, you know, you're going to be teaching 10 courses and, uh, you know, you're going to be on 37 committees, you say to them, I love teaching. And I love being a good citizen and serving on committees. Don't say that's a lot. That's too much. I was hoping on for a don't say it, right? There is a time to say it. I will talk about that in a bit, but not in the interview. Only positive things. No doubts whatsoever. I don't know if I want to move to Tiveria. Um, I don't know. Don't say it. I love Tiveria. Beautiful city. I love the lake. Right? So don't at any point express any hesitations about um, what they throw at you. And do it with enthusiasm. Now, why enthusiasm? Why is it important? And this is particularly true of jobs, um, but even for postdocs to an extent. Um, any organization that is uh, hiring, is has a group or um, a group, group decision to make, right? Whether it's the votes of the department members or whoever it is, the search committee. Um, and often there is dissensus. They're putting a lot of social capital into coming to a single decision, right? If they feel, you know, he seemed a little hesitant about this job didn't seem like that, that he or she the perfect job for them, then that's going to work against you because they don't want to put social capital into creating a consensus about someone who's not enthusiastic and will seemingly take the job if it's offered. So you want to express, this is, I love this job. I love, I love what you're doing. You're doing great things here. The students I met are terrific. Um, I, I like the mission of what this, uh, of what your granting organization is doing. Express positive feelings and how you could fit in to it. It's very, very important. Um, now, what will the interview itself look like? In-person academic interviews, which are unfortunately rare these days because of COVID, but they're still happening. These in-person interviews can be long and they can be wearing. They can be as much as a full day or even more. Others can be less. I know I've had students um, interview at LSE, London School of Economics. And um, basically what they get is uh, an hour and a half job talk and they meet with the chair of the search committee and that's it. But most job interviews are longer. You're meeting with individual faculty members, the chair of the department, a meeting with the search committee, and meeting with individual members of the department, sometimes the dean, sometimes the president of the college. It, it, it varies. Uh, Postdoc interviews tend to be shorter. They don't, they're not all-day events. Um, but you really have to be prepared for... You're, there's a lot of adrenaline in, in those interviews and they're exhausting wearing. So rule number one is, I'll come back to this, you never can get tired. I'll come back to it. It's very important. Um, sometimes you have meals with uh, lunch or dinner with members of the search committee or just a, a number of different faculty members. Um, these are always important. During the interview, always have a pen and a pad available. Note things that people are saying. Um, this makes them, first of all, makes them think that you're taking them seriously. Um, but also, it's going to help you proceed through the interview and afterwards. The points that you may forget when you're just inundated with a lot of things on the day of the interview, make notes of questions you have, of points that they made, of difficulties that you're finding, anything that is of interest. Always have copies of your CV with you. Um, and at the end of the interview, ask them 
for the timeline. When do you think you're going to make a decision? Uh, when do you think you can let me know? Um, I'm really, again, I'm very interested in this job. I think I would fit well. I'd love to hear when you're going to make your decision. Now, I have for you five rules for the interview, okay? One I already said, you cannot get tired. Postpone your tiredness for your trip back home. Um, it, it's, you can do that. It's, it's absolutely possible. I've seen people get fatigued during interviews. As I said, a lot of adrenaline is flowing, but you can really put that off and the fatigue will hurt you. It's going to hurt you. They see it in you and it really creates a bad impression. Rule number two, don't drink any wine uh, or any other hard liquor, which is uh, related to rule number three, which is do not volunteer any personal information or give unsolicited opinions. Do not speak negatively about anyone, anybody in your, your own department, in your, your colleagues, your mentor, your people, you don't, you're going, they're baiting you to hear you. That's why they ply you with wine sometimes, right? It's, it makes you speak more. Don't, don't put in, don't get, I've seen it over and over in interviews. People say things where afterwards they walk out of the room and they say, and the people on the search committee say, oh my God, did you hear that? That really seems uh, like a problem. This person's wife uh, works in uh, Beersheba and we're in Tveria. How are they going to do that? Don't interview, don't give them any in information on your spouse and your children, your parents and your personal condition. Don't speak negatively of anyone or anything. It's very, very important. And it's something they try to get out of you, right? Um, you, you, you answer evasively. Yeah, this is, um, uh, how's, uh, you know, can, can, your, can your spouse uh, come with you to this job? Oh, I'm, you know, we, we always work things out very well. Some evasive answer is really good. Um, rule number four, remember to ask the questions you prepared and any other questions that arise in the course of the interview. Right? This, you know, an interview is a two-way street. They're interviewing you and you're trying to make a great impression so that you will be offered the job. You're also interviewing them to see if this place really is what you want in your life. Um, so make sure you ask the questions that, um, you that are um, of importance to you. And finally, rule number five um, is the strangest one of all, and it is brown nose. Anybody know what brown nose means? Okay, that's a very- I don't, I don't. No, I don't think, I don't think anyone here would know. Um, I know what it is, but I'm an English speaker. Hmm? Excuse me? I know what it is, but I'm an English speaker. Okay, uh, right. So brown nose, you can Google it. Brown nose means to flatter someone, over flatter someone, right? It means you're sort of playing up to that person by flattery, okay? And what? how do you do that? You, you're talking to someone about, and you know you've done the research, you know the article they've read, I loved your article. I think it's a seminal article. That's a really important piece. Now you would think to yourself, ah, they're gonna know I'm brown nosing them, right? I'm just flattering them for flattery's sake. No, they don't know that because every academic has a huge ego in which they think, aha, they finally saw how important my article is, right? They believe in the importance of what they do. So don't be afraid to praise the people you're talking to, the work that they do, the research that you've read on them, the reputation they have. Oh, yeah, I you know, I know you. But I, you know, everybody talks about you. You're the greatest. so. Don't be afraid to do that during the interview. It's a, it's it works well. 
So that's the interview. Finally, um, let me talk about the post-interview, which is brief. You must write a personal note to every single person you met personally or, um, or on personally on Zoom. In other words, as many people as you talked to, you should write them individual notes. Here again, the pad and pen that you had during the interview will help you remind you that you're trying to bring something in from the conversation that you had with that person in the thank you note. I really appreciated your telling me how the graduate program works, if that person did that. That really was helpful to me. Something, not just thank you for talking to me, but try to personalize it, make it at least three, four, five sentences if you can. Um, to the search committee, particularly, ask them if there is anything else you can send them that might be helpful and that you would be glad if they had additional questions or to answer them. Um, make sure that you uh, address every person on the search committee. Um, if the timeline indicates that they should have come to a decision, in other words, they told you, you know, we'll, we'll, we should probably know in two weeks, if in two weeks you haven't heard anything, you can send a follow-up email, where do things stand? I just wanted to reiterate my interest in this job and so on and so forth. Okay, so how are we going on time? Um, can we, should we talk a little bit more about the job talk? Um, we have time. Okay. Do, do we want to stop for questions here or, or should I talk about the job talk and then we'll have some questions? Maybe um, a few questions okay. um, before. Do you, I see Cla Cal Carlos is uh, first and go on, please. Thank you. So a uh, very nice uh, talk, by the way. Thank you very much for this. Uh, very short question. See, uh, what brown nosing. That's very good, Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So my question is, what advice would you give if you are asked a question that no matter how much you're prepared for this uh, interview, you really haven't prepared for it. Uh, so you have to kind of improvise. Thank you. Yeah, um, that's a very good question because people are often asked, especially in their job talks, um, they're asked, what about X? And it's really something you haven't thought about. Don't try and improvise on the spot. That is a trap. And what you can say is, wow, that is a great question. I've just begun to think about that. Um, and I'm not really ready to say what, I'm re not really ready to talk about it yet, but it is something I've been thinking about a lot and I really appreciate your bringing it up. Don't try and answer a substantive question on the spot. As far as other questions go, which are um, more personal, are you, would you be ready to teach a course in uh, theoretical physics? Uh, and you really hadn't thought about whether you're going to teach that course or not. Uh, you, can, you can, at that point, make a good judgment call. Yeah, that's a little bit outside my field, but I think I could do it. Or really, I think that's a little too far outside my field. You, so those kind of non-substance, uh, when I'm talking about substance, I'm talking about your own research and, and work. Um, you, you can, I think, make some answers on the spot. Yeah, Chaim. Hi, Joel. Hi, Chaim. Uh so I have, uh, in some of my interviews I, uh, that I had, I, uh, I got two questions that I really had a difficulty answering. The first one uh, from American universities um, is mostly about um, diversity. They say, you know, we have a very diverse body of students and how do you address that diversity um, in your teaching? So I want to hear, to know if you have any thoughts about a good answer for that question. And the second 
Um, uh, question is at the end of the interview, they ask, Do you have any more questions for us? So, okay. Yes, that's they often ask that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's start with the diversity. And the diversity, um, so, the diversity, some of you are diverse and some of you are not so diverse. So it's, uh, it, it's, e it's easier for the diverse people to address that. But I think what you want to talk is uh, about, this wouldn't come up and I think in an Israeli university, but definitely comes up all the time in American universities. Um, you want to basically say how you, two things. One, how you integrate diversity into your teaching and curriculum. That is the kinds of authors that you wanna bring in, uh, men, women, uh, people of diff from different perspectives. That's the first thing. And the second thing is how you encourage students, how in the classroom you're going to encourage students to bring in their diverse experiences to what you're doing and how it's part of, um, of what you are in the classroom. So I, I think that's what you can do. There's, it's, it's a kind of phony question because everybody has the same answer to it and they really don't distinguish people by that. Um, so do you have any questions? First of all, uh, you know, when they, they, they always end with that question. So you should be prepared for it. On the other hand, don't over prepare for it because you actually may have questions that come up during the, during the interview. Yeah, one thing I noticed here today was that, um, you know, I don't know what, uh, the students all seem to gravitate towards X. I'm wondering, do you have students also that I haven't met who gravitate towards Y? And you're really wondering about that. So you can ask real questions, but in case you don't have any that you noted, noted down, have a question or two ready for them. Um, which is, it can be something I know uh, Daniel Bessner, whom you know, uh, in his interview at the end, do you have any other questions, Daniel? Yes. Could I teach a course in Jewish studies? Oh, yes, of course you could. But he, it was a real question and it was a good question, right? So could I teach a course in X? Um, how big are the courses? Do I get to teach some seminars? Do I get to teach advanced students? Or do I get to teach introductory only? That kind of question. Yeah, you, you, you should have a few prepared. Any other before we... I'm seeing there's chats here. I don't know what the... Um, Uh, should you meet, ask to meet with graduate students in the case of an interview for a postdoc? I definitely would. Postdocs, if it's a live interview, postdocs generally get to work with existing graduate students. And particularly, you could ask for graduate students who are, whom you might do some work with. I think it's, it's a good idea to ask to meet with them. Um, is it acceptable to ask about the department's tools and services to support new staff? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can ask if there are, this what you suggested, postdoc or visiting scholars, but you can also ask, are there research assistants? Um, are there research funds that either that are given automatically or that I could comp compete for? Are there, um, uh, sabbaticals? Um, do I get some time off? Uh, all those kinds of questions about the resources available are absolutely should be asked. Uh, let's see, Omri, uh, University of Tiveria is making significant strides in QS rankings. Okay, that's uh, good to know. Um, and uh, that's all. That's on. You can go, go on for the next step. Okay. Um, all right. Um, 
So the job talk, let's talk a little bit more about that. You can find that online if you want. Um, the first thing to remember in a job talk is, and this is a job talk or for a postdoc interview, that only a very limited number of people in the room or on the Zoom will be in your subfield. So most of the people present listening to you don't have a clue as to the kinds of things that you do. So let's say in my field of political science, you're giving a talk in political theory on Hobbes and someone else is a uh, big data specialist uh, working with Google data, they're gonna have as little idea about what you do as your mother does. And this is important to remember because people often mistakenly gear job talks towards a specialized audience. And in fact, the audience, even in a single department, um, is very diverse. So you have to use a language that is inclusive, that doesn't have too much jargon, that is accessible. And that's why the mock job talks, particularly in front of non-experts, um, could be very important. Um, so uh, present for as general an audience as you possibly can. What about the, uh, oh, let me skip a little bit, PowerPoint. I have a thing about PowerPoint, okay? People often put everything they say that's coming out of their mouth also up on the screen. This is, I think, a big mistake. Um, what you're going to have is people not looking you in the eye, but looking over your shoulder at the screen above you. And that's not what you want. You want them to be hearing you. And so PowerPoints are important, but most often there is way too much information in those PowerPoints. What should you have in the PowerPoint? You should, when you come to a kind of seminal statement, like here's the central question I'm asking, put it up in PowerPoint and say it orally, okay? Put it up. Here's the central argument that I'm making, okay? Use also, um, if you can, illustrations or graphs or figures that you can't orally express well, but that will... Um, help your point. So if you're talking, giving a talk on the rainforest in Costa Rica, right, you're going to have some pictures of that, that make that meaningful and bring it to life. If you're talking about autocratic rule in Russia, have a picture of Putin without his shirt on, right? You, you want to have some kind of image that is going to convey um, what you're doing. Do not do too much with those um, PowerPoints. So that's, that's my point about that. Um, what about the structure of the talk? Um, you start off with a very brief thank you. I, I just wanna say one thing about structure of talks. I've seen so many job talks in which a person gets lost in the introduction of uh, her material. Um, and they never get past it because they start talking and it's, it's, it, it's, it's, they're lost in this introduction. So you want a brief introduction, a brief thank you. And then I would suggest starting with an anecdote. It doesn't work for every field, but I think it works for 90% of fields. What is an anecdote? An anecdote is a story that by telling it, it implies the central question that you are asking, okay? It implies the central question that you are asking, right? So um, you can, let's say you're talking, I think I gave this example in the, when I gave the previous lecture, you're talking about um, the way rivers flow and you give a story of how the Amazon reversed 
the Amazon River reverse directions, right? It's a great story. You have a few pictures of it and you show it. And if your talk is about how rivers flow, it raises that question immediately. So use a story, a story to start because the story will in fact pull the audience in, in a way a dry presentation of your material can't do. If the story comes from your field research or from your laboratory research, great, that's all the better. Something that you saw that really, some people you spoke to, some two, two different people you spoke to that told you different things or two different findings in the lab that don't seem to make sense with one another. That kind of story about your experience will be really important. Then you want the brief statement, what you're going to do. First of all, what question you're going to answer. What is the central question of your, of your talk? Um, and why is this question important? And here I'm going to stop. And again, I have perhaps strange views on this, but I believe they're right. Um, and that is how much literature do you have to bring in to the talk? How many, how much, how many of other authors, research people do you have to mention? And my um, feeling is not a lot. It is really boring to give a lit, lit review and you lose your audience when you do it. I think what you wanna try to do is to say, look, I'm not the only one answering this question. And you rattle off a few people and you'd say, we could talk more about their theories later in the question and answer period. I'm not going to go into it now, but I'm giving something quite different. Okay, so you're not, you're not going into a person by person, theory by theory kind of um, review, you're, but you're indicating you know it. You know it and you're willing to talk about it, um, but this is not the place or time, right? So you're gonna say, look, this is a really important question. Lots of people have asked this question. So-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so have, have all addressed this. I think there's a basic flaw in what they're doing. I can talk about that later in the Q&A. Let me get to what I think is the right answer. And then you give a brief statement of your, what you're going to argue during the talk. And, um, and then uh, very briefly, here's what I'm gonna do for the next half hour. Okay, so you sort of lay out for them. And then what you try and do is bring your case. Don't overwhelm them with audience with uh, evidence, don't try and do your whole dissertation um, or all your research, narrow the talk down. You can refer to the fact that I've done 16 cases. Let me talk about one of them here because I think it really illustrates what I'm trying to get at, right? You, want, you don't wanna overwhelm them because again, they're orally listening to you and they can't absorb that much. So you want to focus them as much as possible. And in that you bring your evidence and your graphs, your, your um, images that will really help you. Um, make sure that the evidence relates very directly to the question that you've asked and that the argument that you're trying to make. Tell them what kind of methods you're using, but don't overdo it and bring the data that will help you. Now, you state at the beginning what your question and answer was. You may want to state it in the middle when you're talking about the case. Remember, I was asking the question, such and such, here's the case, the, here's how the case really addresses it. And then at the end, come back and repeat your question and answer again. That's because of what I told you before, they forget or their minds are drifting away and they're, they're thinking about some wonderful point you made and they forgot the question or they didn't listen or whatever it is. So repeat the question and the argument. And then finally, where you see your future research going and how it relates to what you've done, how it builds on what you've done. You've got to be prepared throughout the interview and especially in the talk 
for what your next step is going to be. Um, uh, even if you don't know it yet, prepare it now. And then tell them you're glad to accept questions and you're ready to go. Now I'm ready to accept questions. Okay. Yes, there is one question in the chat. Let's start with it. Um, and you can answer, answer, you can come up with more answers in person or in text. How much should I prepare to answer questions about my short-term and long-term research plans for postdoc positions? Um, yeah, you should be prepared to answer that, as I just said. Um, you want you want to say if you've started on something already and that you're going to go for, and particularly in the postdoc where that's what you're going to be working on, then that you should be prepared to talk about in some detail um, because that's what they want to hear. What are you going to be doing here while you're here for a year or two years? Um, the long-term research is obviously going to be vaguer. Um, you're, you're, and there you can really have just a few sentences. Really what I hope to do is take this from X and move on to Y, because I think X raises very important questions which have not been answered. And I'm going to look at that. But you don't have to be ready with very detailed answers for your long-term um, research goals. Um, my question is, uh, should you be able, sh should you be honest in the interview? How honest should you be in an inter interview, not to say in academic life more generally? <laughs> so in the interview. Yeah, I think you have to be totally honest, um, but you don't have to volunteer everything. This is a, a, an important point here. Um, omission, I don't think you want to have any um, commission in which you say dishonest things. I, I think that would be terrible. But you don't have to tell them everything. Um, you, you know, and if they ask, you, again, don't have to tell them everything. You can be somewhat evasive about it. What, what kinds of questions are you thinking about, David? Oh, uh, it could be factual or, uh, or you know, um, any questions that you are being asked uh, about uh, how, how, let's say, uh, how eager you are to come to our university or our department. And you are hesitating um, because you have, um, you know, you want a better university or better department. Uh, this, is, this is one. Uh, will you be happy to give uh, introductory classes? Um, how important is teaching for you? You know, um, this yeah. is... Uh, well. <laughs> This is, uh, okay, these questions, these are good questions because they're not going to hire you if teaching is not important to you, and it is to them. Um, they're not going to hire you if you're not willing to teach the introductory courses or if you're unenthusiastic about the place. And I think on those questions, look, you can say, um, I'd be perfectly happy to teach introductory courses. I'd like, also like to teach seminar courses and graduate students. Is that available as well? Um, I think that you, yes, I think you do have to express enthusiasm, even though you might in your heart not feel as much as enthusiasm as you're expressing. Um, yeah, if that's dishonest, uh, that's okay. <laughs> what is your feeling about it, David? I don't know. I would answer the same as you, um, but it's uh, also important uh, the context, how desperate I am to get the fellowship, the job, uh, etc. The, the more relaxed I am about my options, the, the more honest I would be, I guess. Or, or the st straightforward, let's say it's straight, straight do good. Um, and what I, and in this connection, I would also say there is this uh, kind of uh, different personalities type, but also different cultures. And some cultures are very strategic. I, I had a kind of a candidate this year for 
recruitment who was very, very strategic, over strategic in his response. But I got it, uh, this is not about him, it's more about the context and, you know, where he comes from, he was from overseas and so on. Um, and some cultures are very open and, you know, relaxed and they want this kind, they know, they want to know which kind of family you are, which friends you, you know, they, they are expecting something different. So you have to adjust to the culture uh, of the country, of the institution, of the people in the committee. Uh, and of course, all those questions are uh, in regard to specific situation. You have to ad adapt all, all kind of uh, suggestion for the specific situation. You have to se be sensitive to the audience. And, and the yeah, I, 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 would, I would just add to that, that I think that's all true. And I think also you can answer a different question from the one they asked, okay? You don't have to, if you feel, I don't want to answer that question, answer something else. So if they say, you know, uh, what's your family like? Um, you, you could say, I think, you know, families are really important in promoting for the students. And so, you know, you go into something else, you answer some other question. You don't have to answer what, what your family is like. Um, the, there you, and you might ha think about that as you're preparing your for questions, how you answer a question different from the one that they ask. Yeah. And I see uh, Claretta and Carlos and there are maybe others who wants to ask. So Claretta first, let's try again. Yes, um, thank you very much. It's very, very useful. I wanted to ask two questions. One is, about uh, the research of the courses that the department provides. So sometimes uh, when you apply, you need to say which courses you are willing to teach. And I'm not, I'm, I was, I'm, um, I'm not sure whether I should propose um, courses that really complement what the department already has, or I need to propose courses that are introductory and then I can uh, replace maybe some of the like senior faculty who wants to give away these courses. And because I have a limited number of courses that I can propose, I'm not sure what is the right balance. I don't want to um, step on anybody, anybody's toes. So in a sense, I could be doing something similar to others, which is a good thing according to what you said in the beginning, but could it be that they don't want another person who is doing something that is too similar? Like yeah. Yeah, so first of all, um, the first thing I would say is you want to read that job description extremely carefully so that you get a sense from it, if you can, of what kind of person they're looking for and what kinds of courses that would entail. Um, but I think beyond that, you could... Um, you know, you could express both. You could say, you know, I'd love to start, do some new courses that you don't have. Here are a couple that I think would really complement your existing curriculum well. And also I'd be willing to take my hand at courses that um, if there's a rotation, an introductory course or some other course of that sort, uh, I'd certainly be very happy to help so-and-so with that, um, taking it some years if that person didn't want to do it or something like that. Okay, and another question is about uh, postdoc interviews. When I um, present my um, a future uh, research or my, my research plan for the postdoc, um, how much should I emphasize that it relies on what I did in my PhD uh, as, 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 a, as compared to doing something that is novel. So to what extent should it be something that I have a very good basis to do, but then it might seem like a small addition to what I have already done so far, as opposed to really proposing something that is more know, innovative, but may take more time and maybe will be more difficult to accomplish. Right. Um, <laughs> You know, there was a famous scientist who once said he won all these grants by always applying for the thing that he just finished doing because yeah. he knew the most about it, right? Um, no, I think 
look, I think that any postdoc um, understands that you are building on what you've done and you've got to be prepared to talk about that because you can talk about it most intelligently. Um, they also want to know, and, and also you want an opportunity to publish um, what you've done and you can tell them outright, I'm really going to use this to refine and publish what I've, what I worked on during my uh, doctorate. Um, you also should be prepared to say, and here's where I really want to start building on that in a new direction. Um, and you, obviously you can't talk about that in as great detail. That's why you really have to rely heavily on what you've done already for the in-depth kinds of things. Um, hello. Uh, so I have a follow-up question to that of uh, David regarding honesty during interviews. Mm -hmm. So I, I will put a practical example. Sometimes uh, the committee or the interviewer wants to know you as a person and is asking you about a story that really uh, makes you look uh, glorious, so to say. And you know what the committee or the interviewer wants to hear, but sometimes the truth is not you know, that glorious, so to say. So coming back to the point of honesty, to what extent is it advisable to maybe um, stick to the truth or maybe say something that you know that the committee is willing to hear, but maybe less close to the truth? Thank you. Okay, and before I answer that question, Carlos, I wanna say one of, the, one of the standard questions that you should prepare for is two questions. You know, what, are you, what do you feel your strengths are? And what do you feel your, what's your biggest weakness? Okay, you should be prepared for that. On the weakness, you wanna be very careful. Um, again, it, it runs into this question of honesty to what extent, you know, if you are, are a person who leaves everything to the last minute, you don't wanna tell them that. Um, so you wanna be very careful about weaknesses that are not going to hurt your chances. Now, as far as your question goes, again, I would reinterpret the question. Um, I think that if they want the glorious story of X, but you have another glorious story in mind that you really would prefer, you say so. You say, you know, that's a really good question. It does. It is going to show some of who I am. But let me tell you, let me talk about this because I really think it shows it better. And you, you go to what you, to your strengths, um, to what you can do. Uh, I, I think that's, that's your best strategy. Okay, uh, more questions? Uh, if not, we are over time already, and um, I'd like to say uh, thank you very much, uh, Joel. It's a pleasure to have you with us again, um, and I'd like to say um, happy, you know, weekend and evening and uh, winter and snow uh, if you are here in Israel uh, for the next uh, few days. So enjoy yourself, be healthy, and keep uh, warm. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you all.